Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook, who is in a different place. (laughs) It's bringing back lots of memories for me, that, Bob. (laughs) In the training room, the big training room at the Manchester Institute for Psychotherapy, so that's where you did your first training, wasn't it? And that was my view because I used to sit on the couch underneath the window and I used to look out at that very view, Bob. Wow. Wow. It's very busy in Chorlton at the moment. Yeah. Unbelievably. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, so that must trigger back memories for you. Lots of happy memories. Yeah. yeah. Four Thank years you. of virtually every weekend not every weekend but one weekend a month for four years in that room absolutely so the topic of this one um which is quite interesting having just said all of that is life after therapy moving on and letting go well a very apt very apt title um as we're ending 2023 Mm -hmm. moving on to 2024 absolutely So we couldn't get a better title. I mean, it's a specific title and a generic title. So when we think of, um, you know, therapy, psychotherapy, and the sequences of psychotherapy, you know, we have the first stage, which is getting to know the client, and building up a working relationship. Yeah. They can trust you and feel safe and secure. Um, I, I always think developmentally, so I think about safety and security. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, in terms of relational needs. So that first stage can take quite a long time, especially if a person's slightly paranoid or they have trust issues or whatever we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. That take well, it certainly takes a long time. Um, And in that time, a TA therapist, it'd be interesting your thoughts on this, but a TA therapist will be doing things like a script analysis looking at injunctions, counter injunctions, early life decisions, yeah. how they're played out today, yeah. and how those decisions may stop the person achieving what they want. So that will be in that stage. Also, what will be in that stage is contracting. Yes. Treatment contracts, overall contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Then you yeah. have a sort of middle sequence, well, middle, the same middle sequence of psychotherapy, where people have got to trust you and start to do have a good relationship with you and start to do what I would call the, yeah, let's say middle phase of psychotherapy. They start looking at the behavioral issues. Yeah. The babies that need changing. So their script can be different. Then we move on to the next stage, uh, which we could say the latter stage of the middle stage, which is how to, well, basically looking at the emotional changes underneath the behavior changes. And then we move after that to the next stage, which is integrate those new emotional and cognitive decisions with the new behaviors. Yeah. And the final stage, which is particularly pointing to this particular podcast, is termination and endings. So we're going to just concentrate briefly on termination and endings. And of course, uh, letting go and renewing ourselves and moving on yeah it's a bit like a cycle of most life processes in a way so the big question is around clients endings and more often than not it needs to be a co-created decision absolutely yeah. and therapist about endings and when they not only when they want to end yeah but also whether the ending actually is an adapted ending or whether the therapist thinks that there's more work to do or whether the therapist's major confrontation might be, well, actually, by ending too soon, you're not doing the real therapy that you need to do. Yeah. There's a lot of questions that therapist needs to consider in the co-created 
decision about endings. Yeah. And there's also, you know, endings as in, you know, not having weekly therapy. But, you know, for me, a lot of clients will, they don't want a definite ending that I'm never going to come back and see you again. Sometimes they'll go to a monthly or it's important that they know that the door's always open. And even if they decide that now's the right time and we co-create an ending, that they can come back at any point because life happens. Yeah, you see, well, I think you're talking about what is often called in the trade maintenance contracts. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages of that, Jackie, I think. I mean, you're absolutely, absolutely more things, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right. Of course, life happens. And you're absolutely right that, you know, to, to for the client to leave in therapy with a therapist, which perhaps has been gone for at least a year, there's a sense of um, withdrawal or, and maybe even a sense of lack of object constancy. Yeah. But, so we the disadvantages of what you're saying let's start with them is that you know if they know they can come back which i think is the best way forward by the way so i am in agreement with you yeah and if they they may actually stay in therapy for a very long time in a place of dependency without actually full agency and doing a full goodbye because they always know it's not really a goodbye. Yeah, I do. I do understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and that's a very important consideration in this. So the ending work never gets done because they just keep on this never ending maintenance conference, this yeah. never ending maintenance contract. I'm thinking of clients that I've had that, do you know what I mean? After maybe four years, we, we've had an ending where, you know, it's an agreeable one and they've made the changes that they want to do. But then maybe there's been a bereavement or a breakup of a relationship and they've chosen to come back at that point. Oh, that's different for a mate. So there's, there's been a big gap, but then yeah, they've come back different... because of a life event. You're talking about something different than what I'm talking about. Many therapists have what I call a maintenance con contract where yeah. there might be three, four, five, maybe even less perhaps, built in that they can come back. And I see the advantages of that in terms of helping people integrate behaviours and new scripts in their life. Yeah. However, the disadvantage of what I've just said. Now, you're talking about something very different, which is the permission or the... Uh, it will say with permission that the therapist gives to the client when they leave <laughs> that it's always okay to come back. Yes, an open door policy type of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's different for maintenance conference contract. Um, yeah, and that happens a lot, doesn't it? Where yeah. where clients may have life crises. Yeah. Or you want to come back and to continue some of the therapy they actually missed out on uh, when they left. Actually, I don't know how often that has happens. It happened quite a bit with me. Um, it's just the danger with either of the ways we're looking at here is where clients, let's put it another way, where the therapist unconsciously or out of their awareness enables the client into still having a dependency relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is something that I'm conscious of in the therapy process anyway, that you become a crutch for them. You may become. Yes, yeah, yeah. You see, that's very necessary at certain stages in psychotherapy. However, it's a really important aspect to think about when we're talking about endings. Yeah, and it's kind of... You know, I know it's not the same, but along the, the lines of, you know, reparenting, that we're there, we're nurturing, we're guiding, we're supporting, we're doing all of that stuff, but at some point we have to let them go. <laughs> you see, that's such an interesting parallel um, at a developmental level you're talking about. Now, I'm 73 now. I don't, I'm not even going to be so rude to 
guess what your age is, but I am 70, so I was born in 1950. Yeah. Um, in the 50s and 60s, it was very, very common for teenagers to leave home at 18, 19, 20. And actually, I remember thinking around 16 that it was very odd if people weren't married and having children by the age of 22, 23. Yeah. And not many people stayed at home in these sort of, you know, older ages I'm talking about. However, today, in 2023, and for lots of different reasons, by we've got a very different cycle and a very different society. Yeah. In what we're talking about here. And it's very common, very common for kids who are young adults to still be at home yeah. with their parents into their 30s. Yeah. Yeah. It's very common for lots of reasons. Yeah. Um, is it healthy? That's another interesting question. Um, and I understand the parallel you're making completely, you know, and if we look at, I can think of several people, by the way, who their kids who are now young adults are still at home uh, into their 30s or late 20s and the question is is it the parents or significant other people who are enabling this situation because of their own fear of loss etc cetera, etc cetera. and i would argue there's a lot in the case i've just said by the way yeah but again i think there's a lot of different reasons why it happens do you know what I mean one of them would be codependency do you know what I mean that that you know codependent relationship with somebody but it can also be practicalities (laughs) do you you know what I mean they they go away they live their life and then they come back again because something happens or or various things like that which to me does mirror the therapy process Yeah, well, I mean, I think what you're talking about as well, in terms of practical things, is we now live in a generation of economic crisis. Yeah. Of, you know, when people haven't got that much money, when to get a house for the, the, you know, the young child to. There's cultural things as well. Some cultures, it's the done thing that the family all live together. Oh, and, and to into the late 29, 30s, absolutely. So there's yeah. a complication. So I'm not saying we don't understand all these things, but I also am saying and it does parallel the therapeutic process, what we're talking about, yeah. is where significant other people and parents, I think, are part of an enabling process yeah. where children or young adults are kept dependent, not for the sake of themselves but for the sake of the fair the the actual parents who yeah. don't want them to leave home yeah yeah and i Absolutely. i know I, i'm thinking of a couple of people in particular here um and if we do the, look at this as a parallel of what we're talking about with the therapists and clients here it's the same isn't it yeah it's just those same considerations and some therapists who aren't aware of their own say processes around loss yeah or or whatever way we want to look at this, they may, out of awareness, be part of a process where they keep the client infantilized and dependent on them. Yeah. And so leaving takes far longer than it should. Yes, yeah. And I can relate to that. I, I up until partway through my psychotherapy training, would openly admit to not being good with endings. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? When when I finished my psychotherapy training, I can remember it being quite a pivotal moment for me as far as endings were concerned. You know, and normally that would make <clears throat> me sad and feel a sense of loss and grief and all that sort of stuff. But there was some sort of a shift in me that, you know, in order to start something new and have a new beginning, we have to end something. We have to let it go. Yeah. And that's okay. That's part of life. I couldn't agree more. And a 
dilemma that I think therapists face is that many, many therapists, though they come into therapy for therapeutic change and to have a new script or integrate new healthy behaviors, right? Find it extraordinarily hard, understandably so, to let go of a lot of these quite often unhealthy processes because yeah. those unhealthy processes are part of a dysfunctional identity. Absolutely. So to let them go and change yeah. is extraordinarily hard. Yeah, yeah. And some clients, I think many clients actually, wish to leave or go to leave therapy far too early as a way of not dealing with the painful feelings they need to deal. Yes. That's why I said endings, I think, need to be a co-created um, process. Yes. The therapist brings into awareness what they may be thinking about things we've just talked about, and the client can also talk about it as well. So. Yeah. One of my problems around, and I know you didn't mean it this way, so bear with me a moment, is a reparenting analogy. Isn't that I don't believe in spot reparenting, by the way. It's not that I don't even believe in comparisons with a parenting process as with therapy. I'm not talking about those. That's another, another really podcast. Um, but one of the issues is power dynamics. Yes. In other words, the client who still hasn't gone through the child developmental processes is still in a, uh, or can be in a sense of a dependent relationship with a therapist who may or may not even be aware of that. Yeah. So, so to get to an adult, adult co created conversation around endings isn't always that easy. No. Yeah, and there can be a sense of abandonment. Do you know what I mean? That if, if we yeah. bring the subject up, that they feel that they've done something wrong or I don't know, yeah. Mm. And it's for me, it's, it's, it's a long process that an ending isn't, right, we're going to end and we end it in the next session. There's a, there's a process to the ending. Mm. And a lot of, I think, valuable therapeutic stuff can take place in that process. Oh, absolutely. And people might need to practice endings. Yeah, yeah. And the therapy room is a really good place for playing out different scenarios. <laughs> yeah. And of course, with endings comes beginnings. Yes. So, of course, the client is afraid of new beginnings or change. May a lot of things will come up around endings, yeah. just like you've just said. Yeah, and yeah. It needs to take quite a few sessions. Yeah. And again, for me, you know, talking about the reparenting, I don't know, maybe it's my, you know, foster caring background or whatever, <laughs> but there's something about the natural process of individuation and separation. Do you know what I mean? When you've had that bond and that connection with somebody over what potentially could be a long period of time, you know, to separate out from them is, is a is a process in itself. Yeah, and what about if one of those two people, either therapist or client, actually doesn't want to separate and has a lot of investment in staying in this, let's put in inverted commas, codependent relationship? Absolutely, yeah. And again, it's that awareness and bringing that into the therapy room and talking about that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we all bring our own background and our own experiences and everything that's the whole point of having supervision and doing our own personal work so that we're aware of all that sort of stuff in the therapy room so do you, are you saying then do you think it's in the main the therapist's duty to initiate the endings i think in the main it's the therapist's duty to bring up the conversation of endings What's the difference between those two things? I don't know. It just felt easier. It just <laughs> no, what no, you it, said. It, <laughs> I had a reaction to it. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I think because I said it in quite a sort of final way, perhaps. Yes. And you added um, a, di a different slant, which is instead of duty, you added it's their uh, 
you know, he didn't say duty, but their process to actually bring the subject up at least. Yeah, yeah. Which again, I think probably says something about my opinion of endings. I've still maybe got work to do on my own opinion of endings. But but yeah, I, th- I think, yes. Sometimes clients have said to me, do you know what I mean? Um, I want to go to monthly sessions as opposed to weekly sessions or something, and they'll extend them. And then we'll start to have the conversation about what you were saying. Mm. You know, if, if you're feeling able to go a month, then what's changing and what do we need to do about that? And is that that codependent relationship? They just don't want to let go completely, just in case. Just in case the world collapses. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or just in case I need you and you're not available, mm. whatever. Mm. I think we both agreed that endings is or and needs to be a, seen as an important, valuable uh, part of the psychotherapy process. And we need to give it our attention and time so that there's a healthy ending. Yes. And that's actually written in my contract with my clients at the beginning yeah. is that they don't, you know, end abruptly, that we have a conversation about the endings yeah. um, rather than just stopping coming for that very reason. That's very uh, positive, I think, that it's written into a contract. Yeah, for 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 myself and for them, really. Do you know what I mean? That there's a process to it because you know I know we've spoke about co-creative, you know, relationships and all this sort of stuff. But my clients, I am invested in my clients, and if they just disappear on me, that does have an impact on me personally as well as professionally. Well, it'd be odd if it didn't. I agree. Yeah. So there's another dimension to endings, which I th- hope is part of this podcast, which is celebrations. Yes. So do you make endings a celebratory process? I do. A very positive and, and a, a, a way of reflecting back over the changes and, you know, the, the things that they have achieved throughout the therapy process. Well, I think we could put this into the podcast because it's apt the time this podcast is going out. And that is, I'm, I don't know how many people make New Year promises to themselves. Yeah. Or New Year, what's it called? Resolutions. That's it. I do to a certain extent. And I also, when we get to the end of the year, I reflect on whether I achieve them. Interesting. A lot of people do the resolutions, but they don't reflect back. They just make new yeah. ones for yeah. the following that's, year. <laughs> that's why I added it, really. Yeah. And when I look back on whether I've achieved X, X, and X, sometimes I have. Yeah. Sometimes I haven't. But I, I like to go a step further than that and look, well, what stopped me achieving that resolution? So yeah. I remember last, we go back to new, yeah, I don't know, 10 months or whatever it was. January the 3rd or something. I remember making, oh, that's my wife's anniversary, so perhaps it was on that day. But I I made two or three resolutions. One of them was about weight, that I would lose a stone. or I think I I have to go back and look at what the resolution was. I haven't done that. So I need to look at (laughs) what stopped me and how I can, if I want to have a similar resolution again, how I can change that. Another resolution I made was about holidays that I wanted to have, a, as I hit 70, I was 72 then. I wanted to, my wife's 68. Uh, I wanted us to have, you know, at least a holiday every two months. So looking back on that, I've achieved that. Which is probably why you haven't lost the stone in weight, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the two are interlinked. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very interlinked. But when I, well, I think the, I think the exercise lack of, oh, but the important bit is that I look at the sabotage of it. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So that I have, can have a different action or, or look at the psychological reasons behind it. It's the same with the holiday every two months. That was achieved. And when I look back at how come that was achieved, it was achieved because, A, I had a lot of motivation to achieve it. Yeah. 
yeah. he actually made a, a actual ritual out of this. In other words, I would always make I would always make sure there was at least one holiday booked in. You know, but after I'd finished the other holiday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thirdly, in terms of a psychological process, um, I started to allow myself to have permissions to enjoy myself and to um, dip into the, my savings financially um, to allow myself to have the whole day. So, it's on you, Bob. Yeah, so there's a process to it. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's the same in therapy. Yes. That's, that's where I'm going with this. Yeah. Oh, and I will celebrate what I've achieved and look at how I can change the ones I didn't change. So I think, I think when we come to endings with clients, we can use the same system. Yes. I think it's important with therapy, as with you know, New Year's resolutions as well, to kind of have accountability and a period of reflection rather than leaving it for the full 12 months. Do you know what I mean? To quarterly assess where you are and is it working or do I need to do anything? And feedback and regular check-ins is something that I do do with my clients in therapy. Mm. Every so often I will check in and, you know, where are we? And if the contract needs updating or the, you know, the, the work that we're going to do needs adapting or changing, then I will do that rather than just keeping on the same path all the time. So we're both really in on the page with this, aren't we? I th I think it's really good. Yeah, I don't, I didn't do it with myself as much, but I think having had my, you know, recent diagnosis, I'm a lot more conscious of the things that I want to achieve, and I'm a lot more proactive in prioritizing myself in that. Yeah. Right. I, I enjoyed this podcast. I think it's very. Me too apps and i think again the therapy room is a really good place for exploring and developing new routines for when people leave and maybe you know what would be the warning signs if things are starting to dip again mm. you know for me my my script i will fall back in it when i'm not in a very good place so it's understanding the process and what the client can do about that just lots of awareness couldn't agree more yeah so it's the end of 2023 bob so it's uh, only left to say happy new year to all the listeners absolutely the people who watch us on youtube and to say a heartfelt thanks for your support your listenings over the last year and looking forward to uh, another successful year podcast jackie and also say thank you to yourself thank you to you bob and here's to new beginnings in 2024 yes new beginnings what can i say yeah okay doc until next time bob where we are going to be looking Bye. at is there ever any reality in the therapy room no jackie that is honestly a wonderful podcast to start 2000 and 24 with yeah okay no. until next time bob <laughs> take care bye happy bye new bye year bye. Bye. Bye, bye you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode <laughs>